I just wanted to tell you that my band, Lorenzo's Music, just released a brand new mixtape. It's called Romcom Mixtape. Now, if you've been listening to this show for the past three seasons, some of the music that's in the background is actually music from that album. It's music that I've been working on and recorded. And if you want to check it out, you can go to lorenzosmusic.com slash mixtape. And you can either download the album or stream it from all the streaming places. I don't know why all of a sudden I forgot what the... Spotify, there's one. Those places. You know. Whatever you like. Anyway, the entire album was created from start to finish, recording to artwork to mixing and all that kind of stuff using nothing but open source and free software. And on top of that, the music is being released under Creative Commons license, which means that you're free to do whatever you want with the album. You can use it with your own stuff, share it, mix it, remake it, build upon it. And it's being released under the American Bandito label. I'm starting a new label. Figured why not? Do a little net label thing. So check out my band Lorenzo's Music new mixtape, lorenzosmusic.com slash mixtape. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. As I continue with the round of pop-up interviews that I did earlier this year at the Hibernation Liberation, the event was starting to get into full swing. The club owner began playing 80s music videos on all the TV monitors. It was at that point that another person approached my booth. Uh, my name is Finn. I make soy-based candles from recycled cups. Recycled cups, like, uh, I've seen ones where they're made out of, like, beer bottles and things like that. Is it like that or a different kind of cup? Yeah, they're like teacups or coffee mugs or old weird containers that I make into candles. Right. Yeah, like um, coin dishes. Okay. Yeah. What? What? How did you start that concept? Uh, my friend wanted had like a special order to make one out of a specific cup, and it was easier than I thought. So I thought I could make it for other people, and I make a lot of natural body sprays because I don't like perfume but I still want to smell nice so I do that and then uh, bath bombs because who doesn't like bath bombs yeah. so somebody suggested that you make one of these things for him and then you were like all right yeah I was like oh this is kind of fun I could probably do like a side business of it okay. so yeah and then how did you so you knew how to make candles before that is what you're saying like how did you start that um I just did research on it and I use soy wax which is good for the environment um, and I like upcycling things uh, and using the coffee mugs because then you kind of have a treasure after the candles burnt you still have like a mug to use okay. yeah right. and then so what's your background I mean did you do you... I, I mean I love art I like to paint and draw um, so but that's not always easy to make money off of that, so <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I like pretty much any medium to use. I've been experimenting with like block print and um, sewing. So yeah, I kind of my business is called LP Design, so I can kind of have it be whatever I want it to be and not stay too specific. So if you decide to pivot from what you decide you want to make, you could do that at any time. Yeah, pretty much. I'm meeting with someone today who I found on Instagram under the name American Trash. It was an account that mainly showed graphic design work, and a lot of it was kind of in an outrageous nature. I contacted him to meet with me, and it turns out he lived in the same neighborhood as Haley, who I had just talked to. So I said we should just meet up at the Johnson Public House. The day we met, it occurred to me that I had no idea who it was I was meeting. His Instagram account only had pictures of things that he made, so I didn't know what he looked like. And I didn't want to walk up to each person that walked into the place and go like, hey, are you American Trash? Loudon is my name, and then American Trash is the handle. So when he sat down, I asked him why he used a false name and kept all of his personal information off of that account. Different branding, so I have that, and then I have my like more standard graphic design stuff, which is just my name, because that sounds more stuff to get a job and say that you're American trash. Sometimes it depends on what job you're trying to get, but cuz American trash has it's more product based. Yeah, um ish. It's uh it can be it can be the last couple months it hasn't been. I've just been focusing on um 
illustrations. I've been posting an illustration every day for the last, I think I'm on day 78 now, so that has kind of sidetracked my production part of that, of that branding. I haven't had any time to manufacture anything because everything with American Trash, I produce everything myself. So all the shirts, all the buttons, all the cards, prints, whatever, it's all me either screen printing or making the buttons or all that. And so with all of these drawings that I've been doing, I haven't had time to do that. So the last like three months, I would say, I haven't produced anything physical. But once I'm shooting for 100 illustrations, and once that's done, I'm going to go back to how I was handling that brand more. What made you decide to do that? School. <laughs> it's, a, it's an assignment. Oh, really? So you're literally doing it for school. They told you do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm wrapping up my graphic design degree right now. But with that, there is another degree which is focused more on um, user interface and app development and coding and social media branding. So with the social media branding side of it, one of the assignments is to post on Instagram 100 days straight and see how it goes, which was interesting for me because I think I was the only person in the class that already had an established account. Really? Or not, like, you know, other people had Instagram accounts, but nobody had, like, a brand already. So I kind of had to decide if I wanted to create a third account, actually be a fourth account, to just have that be separate, but then I decided to just have it be in there. And then that kind of helped me hold myself accountable because I felt like my brand already had a bar that was set that I set myself. Yeah, I just felt like it would be healthier for me to just throw it in there. At what point don't you go, this is just me and everything I do under this is going to be included? The way that I decide that, I guess, is based more on the tone of what I make. Like a brochure layout or something. I'm not going to post that on Gamer because it's off-brand. But the same goes the other way. Like if I make something like a crude illustration or a shirt or something like that, I'm not going to post that on my, like, take me seriously as a designer account. Like certain things I would do my best to try to steer certain potential employers away. You're not going to offer that one up to Nike if they're considering you for a job? Well, maybe. I mean... I, I guess they have come a long way. <laughs> and a, a lot of brands are... Larger brands like that, I think, are shifting more towards more expressive, less, like, super standard, super bold design. It's kind of, like, right now, the last couple months, I've noticed more and more crossover. There's even the whole controversy with the H&M thing, st stealing street art stuff. That's a big thing. I actually, yeah, I touched on that for an, a different assignment and had to explain that to the whole class. Because basically, yeah, h and starting a war with the graffiti community. It's like, you know, people that destroy things intentionally for free. That's like why they wake up in the morning. So it seems actually like that has settled. Basically, in order for anybody to combat that, they would have to out themselves and become public, which is not their thing. Because at the end of the day, it is still all crimes that have been committed. So it's most, I'm assuming most people in the New York graffiti community aren't going to be super quick to be like, you can't use my art because I did this illegally. Here's my name. Let's go to court. Where are you from? Are you from Madison? I was born in Madison, yeah. On the south, I guess it would be southwest side. Um, Raymond Road, Russet Road, that's the neighborhood I grew up in. When I was 16, I moved more to the east, Isthmus, Isthmus side, and since then I've lived here. But I also um, I briefly lived in Portland and briefly lived in Boston. And I was like 19, 19 through 23, I was, I was kind of bouncing around. How did you end up getting started in basically what became American Trash? Through skateboarding, I think, I would say. so. In the 90s, when I started skating, you go to a skate park or just get to see a lot of the city, and then so you end up kind of back to graffiti and stuff like that. So that was the first, my first introduction to more expressive kind of art. And then me just kind of like being like, well, what if this was funnier or gross? Well, if I would buy that, 
other people would buy that. Why isn't anybody making stuff like this? I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just do it. And I've always kind of had that. I, I view what I'm doing now as the same as what I've always been doing, kind of. But now it's like I have control and I, I'm able to create things that, I guess with the internet, like has, has given me more validation of my what I'm doing more than before. So it's like... Because the money aspect, it's not, like, to be clear, I don't make a ton of money. Okay. It's just snack, coffee money, yeah. basically is what I get, and that's enough. What do you do to promote it, or do you promote it at all? I don't promote it that much, okay. really. I, I have the Instagram account. We've been to the Black Sheet Bazaar here. So it's kind of like a more outsider craft fair. Basically what that is, is it's selling things that are... It's a craft fair, but it's a craft fair for, it's weirder, darker. I, that, that happens twice a year, and I've been doing that uh, for three years or two years. My friends Claire and Lisa set that up, and they've helped uh, that kind of community in Madison grow a lot. How do you know them? There's an old friend of mine. She does tattoos now, but she goes under the handle Snaggle, Snaggletooth Arts, and me and her have always kind of been you know, doing our own thing, but on par like we we've, we've done a lot of things together like benefit fundraisers and stuff like that kind of just intentionally trying to steer things that we find valuable in the community and trying to bring light to that kind of stuff yeah. i'm not one of the people that sets up the black sheep yeah. that's her and uh, my other friend lisa but i've always been a part of it kind of like darker more expressive kind of stuff that people don't it gets overlooked, I guess. I found you on Instagram just basically because what I like to do from time to time is I look for stories that were posted in Madison just to see like who's posting what stuff and you had something on there. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I followed you. Around that time, you had just started doing enamel buttons or at least as far as I knew, you had just started doing enamel buttons. How do you make enamel buttons? I was fascinated. You had those little flip phones. So the flip phone, that was, I think, my third or fourth one that I did. Basically what I do is design something and it gets sent out. And I'm almost positive that the company that I send it out to sends it out to a different company. You make the design, but it gets manufactured through a third party on demand, kind of. Yeah. So the company that I go through is based in the UK. But when I get the boxes, there's like Chinese stamps all over it. <laughs> And then so some of that is like, oh, maybe this isn't, this isn't a good thing. See, I was hoping you'd be able to answer that for me, because I was like, how are enamel buttons, buttons made? The way that I figured it out was there was a, a brand on Instagram that I followed, and they were putting, putting those pins out, like, every couple weeks. I feel like the trend of those is sort of fading, fading out a little bit, like the novelties worn off a little bit, and they're expensive. With the 100-day posting challenge, have you noticed a difference? Has anything come of it differently recently? I was way more conscious then of, well, okay, well, I'll just have to make sure, you know, that this is great and everybody's going to like it. And I think I was more self-conscious about what I was putting out there, and now it's more, fuck it. I'm able to fall back on, if I blow it today, I have to do it again tomorrow. So it's just kind of made me more... Um, have thicker skin about it, which I think has helped me a lot. I like to see art or shirts or whatever. You see a design, and then when you meet that person, you're like, oh, duh, that's that's that person. That makes a lot of sense. Instead of like, oh, here's this like hyper-stylized, branded, whatever trend that's happening right now. You can't see, like it's well done, and they know what they're doing, but it just looks unhuman. It looks like a company. Do you actually put your stuff out in stores or approach people to sell your things? Nope. I haven't got there. I've had a few, like, consignment deals and very, very minimal, like, because I tried to do my best to focus locally, um, but I haven't found too many brands or outlets that seem like they would welcome what I'm doing. And maybe that goes back to being a little self-conscious about things. I could name a few off the top of my head that I think would still translate pretty well like your beer cozies those those work 
those work, but then who sells those? Or, but also at the same time, I'm really busy all the time, so that would add an extra. I don't know, a dynamic of obligations that I have. And within my power, the best that I can, I try to cut out any kind of middle, which is why I'm the one that produces everything. Because it goes back to, it's like, oh, somebody makes shirts. And then, so I just, in high school, I was like, well, I should just figure out how to make shirts. So I don't need to pay somebody to do that for me. If you go back to, if I was doing what I was doing now in like 2002, uh, pre-Instagram, barely internet, I feel like it would be more successful because now it's great to be able to see all this stuff, but it's hyper-saturated. So it's, you know, you're not, nobody stands out as much as they may maybe used to because there are so many talented people out there and now you can see it. Before you couldn't see it, you'd have to go like read a magazine or um, find a specialized website or something like that and be like, oh, this person is really cool. Now you just Instagram hashtag cool shit and it's awesome stuff. Between this conversation, there's probably been like 6,000 posts of things that I would like. (laughs) One promising outlet that has just recently happened in, in Madison is some peers of mine have opened up this new venue called Communication, and that is off of East Wash. But their focus is um, they're doing like DIY, all ages, sober space for music, but they're also going to have a storefront attached to that. And so, what they're trying to do is take people like me or Haley or, you know, just local outsider makers basically and have um, it's like another consignment deal, but. Money aside, I think it's beneficial to our community, and it will put some light on people that are locally producing cool stuff. Is it more youth-based, or is it anybody? I think it's uh, as far as I know as anybody. I don't know exactly their, you know, like, business model so far, but they reached out to me and then some other people that are, like, more like me. In in Madison, there's no um, all-ages venue right now which is really unfortunate like I'm obviously old enough to go to whatever I want but the only reason that I go to any music or I'm interested in art was because of outlets when I was younger that were like that you know if I had just been introduced to this kind of stuff when I was 25 I'd probably have already narrowed my path down in life and it have already been molded into what I'm doing. And it was more all ages venues, going to skate parks, punk shows and stuff like that when I was 15 that steered me into doing what I'm doing now. So although I can go to whatever I want now, I still think that venues, art, just anything expressive being available to everybody is really important. I liked what he said about the 100 day challenge. It made him not think so much about what he was drawing and I can relate to that. Before I started drawing my blog every day, I would spend so much time worrying that I was gonna mess it up before I finished it. So it took me forever. So now I spend like 15 minutes on it, that's it, because that piece doesn't need it. Even in sketchbooks, I would look at the page and hesitate like everyone was gonna see it, like it was gonna suck, it's a sketchbook. I'm not entirely sure where that hang up came from. All right, so next week, I talked to an illustrator who drew a picture of both mine and my wife's butts. You heard me. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. And until next time, so long. Mm